Um, hi, and welcome to the Representing Queerness panel at the Theorizing the Web Conference 2018. Um, I want to thank everyone organizing the conference for inviting us here to speak today. Um, and I wanted to start off um, by acknowledging that we're gathered on colonized indigenous land. Um, specifically, the Museum of the Moving Image is located on the traditional territory of the Lenape people. Um, and that we respect the continued connections with the past, the present, the future, in our ongoing relationships with indigenous and other peoples on Turtle Island. Um, and then to introduce myself, I'm Lucas La Rochelle. I'm a multidisciplinary designer and the facilitator of Queering the Map, which is an online community-generated mapping project that geolocates queer moments, memories, and histories in relation to physical space. Um, I'm currently completing my BFA in Design and Computation Arts and Interdisciplinary Studies in Sexuality at Concordia University in Montreal, Tiotahake. Um, and so the description of this panel is coming from the framework that the representation of self-identified queer people is not merely about inclusion, it's about ending heteronormativity as social control and positing a world of more and better possibilities. So to introduce the panelists, um, the person speaking first is Alex Verman, um, she's a writer and researcher based in what is currently Toronto on occupied Treaty 13 land. Her work focuses on the politics of narrative, identity, and community. And she's a freelance journalist as well as a writer and researcher. Um, and she'll be presenting on social media and queer consumption. Um, next, we will have C, who, will be, uh, who is a PhD student and Vanier scholar at the Department of Philosophy and the Joint Center for Bioethics at the University of Toronto. Uh, their research focuses on the connections between silence, resistance, and oppression in health, ethics, and epistemology. And the title of their presentation is What You See is What You Gender, Pinkwashing and Digital Architectures. And the final presenter today will be Kelly Steinmetz, who is an MA candidate in Media, Culture, and Communications at NYU, thinking about film, semiotics, and the politics of aesthetics. And the title of her presentation is Do I Dare Meme a Peach? Um, so please join me in welcoming our first presenter, Alex Berman. Um, so the title of this one is uh, Social Media and Queer Consumption. Um, it says queer, it's really trans. Um, <laughs> um, not, it's a negligible difference, but I'm just aligning it anyway. Um, and this is a quote from a, a, an artist, uh, Martine Sims, um, in a, a New Yorker profile uh, by uh, Doreen St. Felix. Um, is a great line, representation is a form of surveillance. Um, so, I'll start with the idea of being online. Um, I, like a lot of other queer people, um, kind of just came into myself um, by forming communities on the internet. Um, those kind of conversations, that kind of discourse is like the way in which a lot of us, I think, start to make sense of ourselves. Um, and it's also a way in which um, things sort of push into the mainstream. Um, I read a it's gonna sound stupid. I read a tweet by <laughs> Aisha Siddiqui, who's um, presenting here, I think tomorrow, um, uh, that called something a, like a post-Tumblr kind of world, which I thought was interesting, um, and like a, a, a same kind of way of capturing that concept, that like, um, there are a lot of ways in which people kind of parse their identities um, and make sense of each other um, through those kind of spaces, but they also happened before that. Like there's always been blogging and forums and discussion boards as long as the internet has allowed that to happen. Um, and it sort of mimics a lot of um, uh, spaces, um, underground, um, non-normative uh, spaces like cruising that are kind of inherent in a lot of queer culture. Um, so uh, Tumblr and other spaces like that are kind of like a ground zero for these things. Um, and uh, the translation of an online community into an audience. Um, the idea is that if we can't rely on the mainstream to depict us responsibly, um, we're going to try to do it for each other. Um, the problem is that that's not, um, that doesn't happen in a vacuum. Um, so when we think, like, what do we talk about when we're not talking about it um, in view of, in this case, cisgender people? Um, how do we understand ourselves um, and the topics sort of inherent to a lot of trans experiences um, outside of a cisgender gaze? The problem is that that, um, that gaze is always present. Um, at the same time, there's still a lot of uh, merit to these spaces. Um, I'm gonna use a quick example. Right now, I'm in a Facebook group um, that's like very intentionally, I've been in a lot of weird trans Facebook groups. I'm sure anyone who is queer and like online has been in these 
similar kind of spaces. Um, poorly regulated, um, <laughs> often very inappropriate. Um, but uh, there's something very valuable about um, uh, things that are intentional and outside of the mainstream um, and um, exclusive and inclusive. Like they include people who are from an excluded group and they exclude sort of the majority. Um, and um, without these kind of opportunities to be vulnerable to basically strangers and to form connections with them, um, you don't have the ability to really delve into difficult questions. Like if I didn't have the ability to talk about uh, ways in which I perceive my body, then I wouldn't necessarily want to start on hormones. And these things sort of help break down um, a lot of the, uh, the dominant narratives and expectations uh, put upon queer and trans people. Um, at the same time, we don't really have that much control in our online lives. Um, visibility on social media is contingent upon elements outside of our control. Um, when I say visibility, I'm talking about like the actual reach of content. Um, what is seen, uh, what's perceived, and what's shared. Um, all of these things are governed by algorithms that are functionally opaque to their users. Um, they scrape information and share them, and then from that are like kind of constructed images of us that exist in sort of like an informational space that we don't have access to, um, and the mechanisms by which these are created are kind of completely outside of our control. Um, and uh, businesses that operate online and create that kind of online ecosystem, like Facebook, like Tumblr, like Twitter, like Instagram, the social media platforms by which we sort of are vulnerable with each other, um, are not things we have any control over, and uh, operate on um, an idea of reach that simply by dint of its model, um, aims to communicate primarily to the mainstream, to the majority. Um, so that these systems um, uh, uh, allow for a, a certain level of vulnerability that's very valuable, um, yet um, we're also vulnerable to um, sort of the systemic uh, constraints that are built right in. Um, Social media thereby works to create queer communities that are incapable of self-governance. They exist according to rules outside of their own control. Uh, the image that I have up there um, is of a, a, a representation of a panopticon, um, a bit of a tired <laughs> image um, that Foucault took up in his work. And, and one of the main takeaways of this concept is that visibility is a trap. Like the, uh, the constant um, surveillance operates as a way of um, internal policing. So if we're vulnerable, we're vulnerable for what? Um, this is a picture of uh, Gigi Gorgeous. Um, I'm not putting up to shade her. She looks great in this. Um, <laughs> and she's done, uh, and in her own weird way, um, she's both kind of bought into what I'm talking about and uh, um, sy symbolized a lot of the issues inherent therein. Like she's not heterosexual and she's not cisgender, obviously. Um, yet at the same time, she's um, uh, the process of creating a narrative um, she's a YouTuber, uh, puts up a, a lot of her stuff, kind of works on um, makeup and, and sort of creates a transition timeline. Um, because she's communicating to primarily cis audiences, that's how you make your money. Like, that's how you create a platform. Um, uh, it ends up cementing narratives of transition, of uh, male to female, of a sort of born this way medical model um, that is not necessarily representative of the overwhelming majority of trans people. Um, and she, like many of the other examples I'm going to show, are she's white. Um, and a lot of the images that we have um, of trans people um, that are represented in this way are white people um, are, um, if not passing, then aspiring towards passing in a very uh, binarist, um, racist beauty standard kind of way, um, and enforce um, medical assumptions about um, what it is to be trans. Um, so one of the byproducts of creating these communities is that they are um, commodities to be mined and marketed to and about. Um, and they're marketed about primarily to cisgender people. And there's a sense of a shock and awe kind of effect. You've all seen these videos, you know what I mean? Like where you're like, uh, people are walking in and they sort of have this like sensationalized view of like the kind of violence that trans women are subjected to all the time. And like, I'm not watching this enjoying it. This is for cis people to watch and feel guilty about, but not to do anything with. Rarely do these th things come with policy recommendations. They're, they're um, ways of sensationalizing trans experiences within a very narrow kind of constraint, um, and thereby um, this practice creates certain narratives and narrators that um, are not fundamentally um, 
contradictory to the hegemonic order, like to, to the idea of what it is to be trans and what it is to be cis and, and buy into gender policing. Um, so the images that I have up here um, are meant to help understand the idea of trans subjects um, versus trans objects. Like what role do transgender people play in representations of our community? Um, these are all screen caps um, from a page called My Trans Life, which is uh, based on the titles or whatever, I'm assuming are supposed to be by trans people, but look at the images. Um, they're so, they're super white. <laughs> um, they're super uh, buying into these very particular kind of um, beauty standards. Um, and it's all about inspiration. We have one thing about someone who was in the special forces, and now she's like a stunning femme fatale, and everyone's spending a ridiculous amount of money to look like us, to look fuckable. Um, <laughs> uh, we're transitioning into heterosexuality or transitioning into the circus. Um, so now that trans people are recognized within the public consciousness, how has that recognition been made manifest? What images of trans people do we get? And what's the role of trans people in creating these images? Are we the intended audience? Are we the subject or the object? Uh, and, what does, um, and what does that representation allow or disallow? Uh, in a capitalist online space, recognition is dependent um, upon our ability to represent queer identity or trans identity within legible narratives of transition, passing, coming out, and marriage. The ability of different producers and stories to be recognized as voices of their communities is contingent upon their legibility within these online spaces, how well they can be understood, consumed, and shared by cisgender viewers. Um, so in an era of queer liberalism, social media works to create these communities that are capable of self-governance. Trans spaces online are valuable um, that they offer an alternative to the dominant sort of discourse, yet, um, they're still grounded within uh, commercial context. Um, even in these safe spaces, we're not impervious to surveillance and policing. Everything we do online provides information to capitalist entities that use that info for predictive policing, targeted marketing, and the tracking of individuals and communities by powerful states and multinational companies that exploit labor in the global south. Global capitalism conceals the means by which it reproduces itself online by incentivizing queers to adhere to heteronormative categories like transition, passing, coming out, marriage, etc., and punishing those who cannot commodify their identities with invisibility and misrec misrecognition. If we can't self-advocate by exposing ourselves, by being vulnerable to cis audiences, then we disappear. We don't have vulnerability and we don't have visibility unless we're willing to be vulnerable and then even in attempts to be invisible outside of that, we still remain vulnerable and exploited by capitalism. Uh, this process of narrativization has been marketed as queer trans empowerment, even as it reinforces violent norms in accordance with the demands of capital. And by dint of engagement, we're supplying information to power the mechanisms of surveillance and commerce that themselves directly exploit queer and trans people. So what do we do? <laughs> um, I don't have a slide for this, but I will take the opportunity to advocate for armed struggle and revolution, etc. <laughs> <laughs> Um, oh my god, and I'm still under the time limit. Um, I'm going to close this if that's okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm C. Here's my talk. Um, if you want to tweet anything, my handle's up there. Um, I just want to start off with some access things real quick. First of all, this slide is not accessible because I've had a lot of executive dysfunction. I'm going to have a, an accessible one up line within a week with image descriptions. But if you want to follow along, if you're at home, if you're streaming and these are not super visible, I have a lot of screenshots, uh, you can either scan that thing or go to cdf.so slash ttw18. You can download a, a PDF or a PowerPoint version of these slides and follow along as I go. Uh, a few things, I'll probably discuss content that can be like distressing to people, but also I don't know what's distressing to you. Uh, prioritize your well-being, feel free to move around, walk, roll, slide as you need to, as long as it's not too disruptive. Uh, English is my first and basically only language, and I'm a very anxious person, so I can speak quite quickly. If I'm speaking too quickly, just wave at me, I'll try to slow down. If I use an idiom or a phrase that's not clear, let me know, I'll rephrase it. I'd rather have a clear presentation than finish all my slides, realistically. Um, you're welcome to take photos, just, I think, uh, try not to take identifiable photos of other people, but if uh, they're cute photos of me, that's fine, you can take me, <laughs> and we'll go from there. 
um, and tag me if they're not cute and I can report them. Um, so here's some general things that I'm interested in as a researcher. Questions around silence and exclusion. So things like who are spaces and conversation designed for? Who gets to join or access a space or conversation? Who gets to be seen or heard once they're in those spaces and conversations? How do sh spaces shape our abilities to act or be together? And then how can we change these answers? So I'm gonna give you some examples before heading into gender stuff just to give us a more concrete foundation for intuition. So I have two images up here. Um, on the left, there's a bunch of people in front of a storefront. There's a visible blue ramp there. This is the Stopgap Foundation. They have a community ramp project which aims to increase access to buildings by making and distributing low-cost ramps. Uh, so that's the image on the left. On the right-hand side is a, a poster on a store on Bloor Street in Toronto that says, we have a stopgap ramp available But somehow you gotta get over the curb inside the building <laughs> and say, hey, can I have a ramp so I can get in the building or bang on the glass? I don't know. And once you get in there, the aisles are not broad enough to even move with most accessibility aids, such as wheelchairs or scooters. Um, another example here, on the left I have a, a blueprint of a classroom, this is at the university, this is a classroom I've been told is accessible for me to teach in, in the summer, and it's supposed to be accessible because you can see in the bottom curve here, there are four users of wheelchairs around the tables there, so this is supposed to be an accessible classroom. Um, however, on the right side, you can see the flight of stairs that you need to get up to to get to the classroom. Uh, hiding in the top right corner, there are two manual doors that are extremely heavy, there's a curb up to the front door of the building too. And so some venues advertise having things like accessible washrooms, accessible spaces more generally, but they hide them behind things like heavy manual doors, past staircases, narrow hallways. And so there's a question about access and inclusion. What work do we need to do before we can advertise something as such? This is just to give you some stuff in a, in a sense of disability, but more broadly, those spaces which are deemed accessible or inclusive often only do a sort of surface level aesthetic work to appear inclusive, to get those brownie points, right? Rather than enact functional structural changes that actually change the way we use and that can access spaces more broadly. And so today what I just want to cover briefly are two examples of trans and gender inclusive quote unquote initiatives in digital spaces that actually fail to make structural and functional changes. And so my hope in part is this is an extremely boring talk. Maybe you already know everything. Good, that should be distressing. Right? Some of this stuff is more than four years old. I did not expect to submit anything to this conference. I'm like, the only thing I have is four years old, but nothing has changed. So here we are. Um, some brief clarifications. I don't want to suggest that there's responsibility on specific individuals or groups. I just want to focus more on the structural, systemic practices of inactivity and non-commitment to meaningful change. If we talk about groups like Facebook, you have to recognize there are trans people on staff there, trans people who are marginalized by the company and their services and disproportionately affected by those services as well. Um, I also don't focus today on things like real name policies or banning and reporting systems, etc. Uh, these are important. Tons of violence and exclusion are enacted by these systems and they totally tie into the stuff we're talking about today. But I've got like 12 minutes and probably a lot less than that now. So, uh, first example, let's talk about Facebook, boo hiss. Okay, uh, <laughs> February 13th, 2014, right before Valentine's Day, Facebook diversity announces New custom gender option. Uh, it's for US English only, and the next year it rolls out to the UK as well. There are over 50 genders listed, um, and you can set the privacy options on those. And the singular they pronoun is added for public pronouns. Well, technically reintroduced, they used to have it, but uh, Q&A, I guess. Um, some initial ongoing responses to Facebook that weren't just vile garbage that hated on trans people. They said, hey, uh, 50, whatever, that's great, but it's still limited. So in 2015, Facebook response says, well, have an open field. You can enter things as you want. They said, well, there's limited pronoun choices. Nothing's changed. Uh, there's no change to relationship options, interested in options, family members. Uh, family members have been changed since 2014, so you can have you know, a sibling, a parent, rather than aunt or uncle, and things have changed that way, but nothing, nothing else in four years and two months now. Available only in the English language, as far as we can tell. Of course, there, there are language differences, so Yoruba and Haitian Creole, for example, tend not to have gendered pronouns. Uh, but for the most part, this is restricted to the Eurocentric Western world. And they do all this, and they're so positive, while they continue to ban trans people, indigenous people, black people, people of color, sex workers, all just for having not real names, whatever that means. Uh, so here's a photo of the original post from Facebook. I just want to 
I just think it's funny that this rainbow flag here, which is supposed to be a, a symbol of you know, uh, pride and queer pride, it's actually transparent. You can see the structure behind it, and I just think that's funny. <laughs> um, so here's some things. Like here's a visual. So if you go to your Facebook profile, you go to about, you go to sort of detailed settings, you can change your gender. And so if you pick a, a binary gender for which they've chosen the words male and female, uh, if you pick one of those options, it says your gender is public. Uh, but if you pick custom gender, you can sort of start entering your gender uh, per terms as you choose. Up to 10 tags will be allowed. Uh, and there, you can set the privacy on that gender as well. And in the top right, you can see the drop down for pronouns. They give examples of three different pronoun choices, sort of her, him, and them. And then I also show in the bottom right, there's a picture of if you go to relationships, five minutes, thank you, uh, family members, you can see some examples of gender neutral things there. So here's some, some of the things that apparently have changed on Facebook since uh, 2014. Um, here's some things that have not changed. The sign up page. So if you want to join a new Facebook account, you can pick female or male, and then I guess you can change that later, right? Just like if you can get up the stairs, you can actually use the room. Um, interested in, well, there's more than 50 genders, uh, but you can be interested in two uh, or both. Um, down here on the bottom right, I have a screenshot from the developers page, and the same is both for advertisers and people developing applications for how they target their audiences. Uh, it says, all. Oh, men or women, and all tends to include both. So there's some skepticism about how these things are actually enacted when you get behind the scenes. First of all, because when you sign up four years later, uh, you don't have that option to customize. And then you can be interested in binaries. And then the advertisers function again on a gender binary. And so when Facebook wants to be inclusive, it seems like functionally this is not how things tend to work. Nothing behind the scenes when it comes to profit, aside from the aesthetics of seeming queer and trans friendly, seems to operate there. So with limited time left, let's talk about Tinder. Dramatic switch. Um, so here's some screenshots just of Tinder. If you're not aware, it's a social search app that's typically used for dating and hookup culture. And so what you get is you get profiles, and you can swipe right or swipe left. And if you both swipe right, it's a match, and you can start a conversation. <laughs> uh, November 15, 2016, Tinder announces that they will introduce a field, free field entry for more genders. And so you can enter more than just male or female. And so it looks something like this. Uh, so these are, again, images from Tinder. So you go to the gender page. You can pick man, woman, or more. And if you are more than a man or a woman, you can enter your gender as appropriate in the field, and you can take it that way. As you continue along, then, uh, you have this option. So say I'm non-binary. Include me in the search for, well, either men or women. Not even both. And so again, the introduction of, well, non-binary, agender, right, two-spirit, third-gender people, we welcome you on this app. Cultural diversity, gender diversity. Uh, but you got to, you know, either pass as a man or a woman for our purposes. Now you can show me when I'm searching for other people, men, women, or both, uh, but I can't search for non-binary people. And so something I just want to highlight of this text on the bottom, see on the next slide, here's their initial advertisement. They say, you can also select to be shown in searches which best reflect your identity, as long as it's man or woman, right? On the right, the show me man or woman, you can see in the small text here, it says Tinder welcomes everyone. Discovery settings can now show users who include more information about their gender identity. Once users add information about their gender, they can choose to be shown in searches that best reflect their identity, as long as you're a man or a woman. So here's a, an image of, on the left, what a, a profile would look like. So this is a, a sample profile of Billy, who's a trans woman, bless you. Uh, so here is the initial page that shows up when you're swiping, and people just tend to swipe on these. But if you click through the profile, you can see in tiny, tiny writing, trans one. And so your specified gender can appear on your profile card if you so choose, uh, but only if and when users actually click through to your fuller profile, and that depends on your privacy settings. So choices about your visibility and disclosure, what control you have over these things, are left to be made knowing that there are no structural changes to how Tinder is functioning, despite having these identity markers show up on your profile. 
that Tinder continues to ban and accept reports and bans against trans women, especially, and other people for using non-real names. Accepting reports from users of, well, fake identities, even when they indicate that they're trans or non-binary or otherwise in their profile. Nothing structural has changed. And yet, Tinder's really happy about this. And even your feminist fave Bumble, another dating app which uh, the quote-unquote woman uh, has to sort of initiate the conversation or the match disappears. So everyone online, Bumble, the feminist Tinder, feminist dating app Bumble. So there you can uh, sign up as a female or a male, and it profiles usually from your Facebook account. So if your Facebook is not set to either a male or female, it will say, uh, we don't know what's going on, pick one of these two. And then if you go to change it, it says, well, if you change your gender now, you can only change it again one more time. You won't be able to change it back. And they'll block you from changing your gender if you try to pick an identity that better suits your tag. And so overall, efforts of inclusivity fail to enact adequate change or do anything when they don't also change the structures that shape, enable, and allow for certain activities, behaviors, and ways of engaging with others. That's my talk. Thank you. I look forward to the Q&A. Uh, this should be fun. This presentation is called Do I Dare to Name a Peach? So taking a cue from T.S. Eliot's question in his poem, The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrog, this paper updates the concerns implied in the question, Do I Dare to Eat a Peach? So in asking Do I Dare to Meme a Peach, this analysis places the question in the conversation through the internet and social media, looking at the peach emoji as a fruitful site to explore how the distinctly digital lexicon functions and can help chart the distance between the current world and queer utopian futures. It allows us to look at how bodies become rendered on the internet, and once those bodies are rendered, how they can reach for one another. So to begin exploring the peach emoji's background, one could say its journey begins in relation to the phallic eggplant emoji, in looking for an emoji shorthand for the butt and or vagina. So on Instagram, someone found these images that were actually standing in for gendered bathroom markers, so this to say, its social meaning and function <laughs> communication really begins fleshing out in the space of the feminine and mostly like heteronormative relation. So while concurrently having queer use within this definitional formula of signaling the non-phallus, its hegemonic areas of proliferation are in terms of heteronormative and or capitalist ideals. Firstly sex, but also surrounding idealization of specific body types in a kind of health or fitness culture context. So for the purposes of this analysis, any kind of use even in queer spaces for the peach emoji to stand in for a body part is within its hegemonic use, as it inevitably carries with it a sort of limiting discourse about what bodies can look like and what they can do. So to begin thinking through the potential for more queer and counter-hegemonic ways of seeing and discourse that can be generated by the peach emoji, we need to subvert how we are seeing and circulating it. Drawing from the seminal work of Jose Esteban Munoz, particularly in his book, Cruising Utopia, The Then and There of Queer Futurity, I'm thinking about how the emoji can be subverted to signal a more queer other world. So he writes, queerness is essentially about a rejection of the here and now, and an insistence on potentiality or concrete possibility of another world. <clears throat> Excuse me. So if we were to apply this definition of queerness to images, we need to ask what images may allow us to insist on another world or what ways of seeing don't foreclose this other world. So he also writes, to critique an overarching here and now is not to turn one's face from the everyday. Roland Barth wrote that the mark of the utopian is the quotidian. So such an argument would stress that the utopian is an impulse we see in everyday life. This implies it is to be glimpsed as something that is extra to the everyday transaction of heteronormative capitalism. This quotidian example of the utopian can be glimpsed in utopian bonds, affiliations, designs, and gestures that exist within the present moment. So we use this passage to think about a few things. Firstly, thinking about the everyday and the quotidian as a site for queer subversion, and how this subversion is a dare. Not just to change what we look at, but like fundamentally how we see, especially something as everyday to us now as the emoji. Then to think about where within this present moment that this extra can be understood therefore allowing the queer utopian to be glimpsed. So what we need is an example of the more limiting, like everyday transactions of heteronormative capitalism that the extra would exist against. So even thinking in the strictest terms of the peach emoji, we need look no further than its Kimoji appropriation. So Kim Kardashian's effective like claiming and remaking of the peach emoji 
into like a self-branded Kimoji, emphasizes her butt-centric brand with an obvious analog to her body, and acting all too perfectly here as a heterosexual capitalist object, especially in its emphasis on the peach representing a female body, and furthermore standing in like direct mimetic like relation to one of the world's most photographed and most famous bodies. <laughs> And people buy it. Um, I'm not above this, by the way. But I um, <laughs> want to think about the ways that this sort of heteronormative capitalist vision like, might limit our seeing and how we can move towards like, a more queer or utopian vision. So let's explore how the peach can be transformed in a way that can make those utopian bonds, affiliations, designs, and gestures into something more legible. So this may or may not be familiar to people. Uh, this scene is from the 2017 uh, popular gay fantasy love story, uh, Call Me By Your Name, where our protagonist explores the sexuality uh, with women, with a man for the first time, and with this fruit, showing increasingly queer ways of relating. So in Munoz's terms, it's away from the here and now. It's away from the hegemonic architecture that defines good objects and bad objects. It's definitely extra to the heteronormative capitalist ways of relating. It's not a straight line between two points, not an exchange, and not about performing a pre-assigned choreography. In making the third object part of an expression of fantasy, it presents a different affective relation. This triangulation between two bodies and an object, but also triangulation between a real body, queer fantasy, and an object, gestures outward, toward third parties, toward communities, toward the limitlessness of fantasy itself saying that not every possibility is contained within the bodies of a couple, no matter how beautiful they are. <laughs> so, this scene tempted or dared its fans to use the peach emoji to signal this moment, or more broadly in celebratory identification with its queerness, should we sauce or love. So I would argue that the emoji in this context is subversive, because it is not standing in for the inert peach, nor a body as it previously was, but a scene. The peach then, in standing in for this scene, communicates more of an affective force than a prescriptive arrangement. This new use then subverts the heteronormative, productive, capitalist use that the Kimoji epitomizes and puts the emoji into a fundamentally more queer and utopian space. So when I ask, do I dare to meme the peach, I'm asking about the dare to subvert the mimetic use of the emoji, in which it mimics the outlines of a specific looking body, references particular use of that body, to what I am considering the memetic use, in which the peach emoji acts more like a meme. <clears throat> this to say, in representing a scene, or, or a queer jouissance, the symbol is newly endowed with both recognition of a moment and the ability to express any other kind of fantasy that the peach allows us to imagine. Where my mimesis is about mimicry, about straight lines and straight relationships between objects and their representation, the meme allows us to think of a different kind of relationship between the image and what is being represented. So to pull a dictionary definition of the meme, it is an element of a culture or system of behavior that may be considered to be passed from one individual to another by non-genetic means, especially imitation. So from here we could think of a kind of, of queer kind of evolution that does involve community forming, but in a distinctly not straight way through this idea of the non-genetic. So this term is interesting for thinking of a model of expression and relation that is not confined to mimicking a hierarchical structure necessarily, but perhaps about modeling a feeling and giving that sense of kinship or imitation a less rigid genealogical shape. So in order to lean into that sense of the meme's possibility though, we require thinking of the way it permits both recognition and permutation in use. While we think of the meme as a familiar structure which is circulated, the meme, the meme is equally about variation as it is about sameness. As Arya Dean writes in her article, Poor Meme, Rich Meme, relatability helps memes sustain a kind of cohesion in collective being, a collective memory that can never be fully encompassed. One can never zoom out enough to see it in its entirety. This analysis of the meme solidifies how it works uniquely to express both knowing and feeling known through relatability, but also gestures outward toward a limitless space, a limitless sense of collective being with infinite potential for variation within the recognizable structure. In its change of use, the peach emoji itself turns into a memetic object, or a kind of meme, as it shows this creating of space for variation. It transforms from a memetic object that could only show one limited version of the world in its use, to a symbol that can contain any variation of queerness. This latter understanding has a more queer ontological structure 
that underscores, underscores a collective sense of being while allowing space to glimpse that utopian other world. So the stakes of this discussion are in what discourse we attach to the emoji and how those ways of seeing inform its political potential. So instead of seeing the emoji as an extension of the mimetic, like the most mimetic of art, the photograph, we can see it more clearly as the extension of the meme. So to better understand what the implications would be in looking at the emoji in mimetic terms, we can look to Kaja Silverman's writing on this very issue with photography in her book, The Miracle of Analogy. She's also interested in the limits of mimetic thinking. So she looks at how the photograph itself is limited when only being thought of as an index or direct mimetic representation of the world, and thinks instead with the word analogy, which in her terms is related to mimesis, but is more about the insight that images provide to inform how being is structured for everyone. And in this formulation, points less to a specific thing or its specific past, but also this mimetic idea of a collective being and possibility. Her view, though, of how the photograph should be seen moves us out of recording the past and into an awareness of active existence within a constellation or world. So she writes that photography is also an ontological calling card. It helps us to see that each of us is a node in a vast constellation of analogies. When I say analogy, I do not mean sameness, symbolic equivalence, logical adequation, or even a rhetorical relationship, like a metaphor or simile, in which one term functions as the provisional placeholder for another. I'm talking about the authorless, untranscendable similarities the structure of being, or what I'll be calling the world, and that give everything the same ontological weight. So this is really interesting for my discussion of the emoji and its ability to do more than be a metaphor or placeholder for a body. It too, in its mimetic status, can show us how being is structured, especially in Silverman's world, which has a kind of queer utopian hue as well. So what she's saying here is beginning to get at the move I'm also trying to make, which is to think of an image that does represent the world with some legible similarity, but to think of it not only as a having been there, but more of a gesture to say we are all being and can look to another world. In place of the hermetic indexical relation, this same ontological weight and presence in constellation allows us to feel the collective being that Dean ascribes to the meme. So when the peach emoji is standing in for the peach scene, it is doubling down on what makes that scene so interesting on its own, giving the peach an ontological weight more equivalent to a body and giving fantasy an even more queer, limitless quality. So with this ontological status, relations between bodies can change shape and are not limited to pre-assigned outlines. So what is most interesting to me is how the ontology of fantasy, or even utopia, both is and is not reducible to representation. The mimetic subversion of the peach emoji uniquely gets at that, standing in for a scene of fantasy, not by prescribing anything precise, but gesturing toward a jouissance that can take any shape. Okay. Um... Well, I'm, so that was fantastic. Thank you all so much. Um, and I'm so happy that you ended, or that we're, you were working through Jose Nino's in your presentation, because I wanted to move from the panel to the um, conversation period with a uh, Nino's quote, um, which is that queerness is not yet here. Queerness is an ideality. Put another way, we are not yet queer. We may never touch queerness, but we can feel it as the warm illumination of a horizon imbued with potentiality. We have never been queer, yet queerness exists for us as an ideality that can be distilled from the past and used to imagine a future. The future is queerness's domain. Queerness is a structuring and educated mode of desiring that allows us to see and feel beyond the quagmire of the present. So I wanted to use that as sort of the entryway into the discussion, which I think we're going to move over here now. Um, Um, and certainly certain uh, relations of power that um, they already 
zero parallels, so like we um, sort of abstracted, and again, which is not the same as what we're doing, but like I kind of want to just take that for the concept of the bad, of uh, like abstracting it sort of outside of that context and putting out the for both the degree, we're still cutting off the people um, in parts of the world that um, many of us, not to say in this room, but in a broader sense, in this part of the world, um, don't imagine as people who are the emoji approval process. And so we're thinking a lot about the representation of emoji, who gets represented and how they get represented, and then how the Unicode Consortium thinks about that representation. So maybe you could offer a bit more perspective on that. Can we give a, a brief summary of the, the question too? I won't be able to do it, but just um, for people online who might not have heard. So I just want more perspective okay. on like how, uh, just to dive a little bit deeper on the importance of emoji and like if you could give a message to the Unicode Consortium around the rep like who gets represented and how they should be thinking about approving new emojis, I would love your perspective on that. I think like my personal opinion is less to toward like what emojis should exist, although I think that is like a discussion worth having. But in terms of my thinking, I'm more concerned with like the way in which they get appropriated and circulated, and I don't think that Unicode necessarily has a way to like circumvent, you know, bad use or like, you know, bad political attachments to certain emojis. So I think that's less where I'm at, but I don't know if you guys have feelings as to what emojis you feel would be more um, inclusive or representative. Does that get at your question? Yeah, it's huge for I would like them to be cuter. <laughs> <laughs> this is not even really directly responding to what you said. Um, but yeah, I don't um, I think uh, it's actually interesting to think about emojis as like ways of representing and also like representing different representations um, uh, and so sort of spiraling off um, because um, I, I, the things that you're bringing up, um, I, I heard I listened to some podcast episode about it and it was like interesting because it was kind of the first time I thought critically about emojis and then realized that like I like, don't really use them very much and it's like interesting to also think like how different people use them in different contexts. Um, 
and like really just like the sexual ones are the ones that like come up the most frequently in at least like a lot of um, queer spaces, but I'm saying that maybe with a limited perspective. Um, so I think um, it's interesting, uh, uh, this is also not directly <laughs> responding to what you were saying, I'm sorry. Um, it's interesting to think about how um, uh, emojis kind of also stand in for the, um, what we talk, what um, C was talking about in terms of like uh, perceptual, if not um, substantive or structural change. Like um, as a sort of, uh, there, was, there was this one example of the worrying about um, gun violence, and so like different sites were changing their gun emoji to a water pistol. Was, like, okay, cool. <laughs> um, and I think it's um, we can like look at emojis um, outside like the meaning of an emoji and more as like a symbol of ways in which um, the web or tech or like these kind of structures um, and systems in like our, uh, I don't want to be an increasingly connected world, but I'm going to say that, um, and, and like online spaces are frequently um, more symbolic than they are real, and the things that are real are um, outside of like a democratic kind of control of um, users, subjects, people. So I'm just going to pick up and there's a question back there for later. Okay. Um, so I think when we're thinking about using emojis, my, the most engagements I have with it are, are questions of, well, uh, who gets to use which ones, both in terms of representation and co-opting of voice, so we now have emojis that represent different skin tones, and there's just some colorism and appropriation of those. Um, who's involved in sort of creating these? We have new disability emojis coming out. Some critics of them have indicated, for example, that uh, the mobility icon of a wheelchair, the manual wheelchair, the wheels are too far back. You'd have to screen your arms in a way that disabled people who are users of wheelchairs tend not to. And so little little tweaks in representation, but then also uniformity of this. So I, I use an Android, and I can't read half the emojis that people send to me. Or if they send them to me, I drastically misunderstand what they mean, because they show up radically differently in different spaces, including online. And then there's issues about, again, who gets to read these in certain ways. So if you're using a screen reader for visibility accessibility online, uh, I used to have emojis in my Twitter name because it was really cute to have little flowers in there. But then people told me, well, my screen reader reads your tweets. Every single tweet says, see, you know, pink flower, pink flower, pink flower. And it's, it's an accessibility issue of getting to the text sometimes, or interrupting text with clap emojis to symbolize different forms of voicing in non-white communities in particular. Again, the truncating of that for people with different disability and visibility uh, access needs. All that sort of stuff I haven't seen good policies on or, or best practices on how to use emojis, and I just get very confused by it a lot of the time and don't know what to do. That was a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> there was a question. Yeah. Yes. I just wanted to add the emoji conversation. Um, Should we take the mic up there? Pass the yeah. second. Yes. Hold Thank you. on. And I love the way you totally went right where I was going to go. It was like I threw a dart and there you were answering for it. <laughs> but I do struggle with the voice interface with emojis. Because if you have a car, and a lot of these non screen interfaces will read you emojis. And it's, there's an accessibility issue, but then it causes problems in relationships. Because my husband will hear things over the phone while I'm talking to him, and he thinks it's another boy's name or something. <laughs> and it's just the description of an emoji. Um, and we don't talk about like how someone hearing what an emoji's name is affects them. Because uh, then they're like, well, why did you pick that emoji for me? Um, there's a whole like relationship tension that happens around emoji. And then the other thing that I really struggle with is I've had emojis that have been retired. So I have entire sets of feelings that are somehow like no longer relevant in the world because this emoji yeah, isn't great. real. Um, and I think we don't really talk about the systematic need to identify as symbol and when that symbol is controlled by someone else and then co-opted. I mean, cultural appropriation and capitalism is all great, but like parts of my life are being deleted in real time, and I struggle with that. We would love to host that conversation. Yeah, I, yeah, <laughs> yeah that was really interesting. It's also the, um, uh, a good way to sort of muse on the idea of like an emoji as not like, how do you describe it? Because it's not really like, you're not. it's not the word, it's not the image, it's the mood. But that's not like, it's like it's so hard to evoke that in um, a way that is um, universable and like parsable, um, and a lot of that kind of depends on uh, different contexts, which have the material consequences. Yeah, 
So I just had a question for the panel. It seems like what you guys are kind of uh, talking about is the phenomenology of web spaces and the way in which we interact affectively with those spaces, uh, and I'm forgetting your name in the black shirt, particularly with regards to uh, the way in which we encounter emojis as non-discursive. So if I'm taking your meaning, we're thinking about emojis as representations of feelings and the elimination of said emojis as eliminating the possibility to make present those feelings to other people. Is this kind of what we're getting at here? Um, sort of. My name is Alex. Um, <laughs> um, sort of. I mean, I don't. I don't have a way of sort of translating that into like a, um, like a do or don't, like a, a where the things should go from there. But I, uh, I think it's um, interesting to think about um, how uh, moods, ideas, or concepts are sort of translated um, uh, due to so many other kind of um, contextual characteristics. Um, I, I also don't think that fully answers your question. I think the only person here does do like <laughs> philosophy or critical theory, so I'm like, <laughs> <Okay. laughs> just, just bop it along. So I just yeah, I just wanted to just a note about the emojis, and then I'm going to ask another question. But the emojis are like, as much as they are like uh, used to signify like mood, like mood hashtag mood. Um, <laughs> They are now being used as like uh, like actual labels for things in like uh, like digital interfaces. So, for example, like digital banks use emojis to like uh, signify like a cash point as like a little like bank, like ATM mm -hmm. emoji. Um, so this it's becoming a little bit more normalized and a little more uh, solid, which is why like Unicode shout out to the conference and the democratizing of emojis uh, needs to be a little bit more solid with what they use. Whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, I was gonna ask about uh, so talking about democratization um, and like actually like working with so is there any do you, do you, any of you know of any work being done with uh, within like companies like like Facebook um, or uh, Tinder who's owned by that or who owns Tinder but uh, to actually like be inclusive and is this work needed and like is 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 it like how how do we imagine that and like how by participating in like this shitty capitalist economy, uh, is that good? <laughs> or, yeah, I don't know how to phrase my question. Did you understand what I was saying? I feel like that's boring. Okay, I'll, <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll try to. Is this mic pulling in the back? Of the uh, short answer is I don't know. And then the long answer is here's why I don't know. <laughs> um, so, doing, doing the research and trying to get access to what's going on when we created these like gender things for Facebook and Tinder and all that. Uh, so they're drawing in consultants from trans advocacy groups. Uh, they're bringing in people even internally because they're continuing to hire people who are from various marginalized communities. Uh, but then, you know, we've also got sexism charges filed against Facebook and Tinder by employees. We've got lots of charges against them in general as company practices. Uh, so one thing I'm concerned about, in, and this is why I had a caveat of like, I'm not trying to pick out any individuals or groups or anything, because I don't know when people come into a conversation about consulting, if any of you have consulted ever as sort of a token consultancy to, again, appear inclusive. It doesn't always matter what you say in terms of how that gets updated. And so I'm concerned, because I'm concerned about things like representation, how people actually listen to or attend to voices when they bring them into the room, what happens next. Because all I've seen is that they bring people into the room, and we don't have a lot of reports of what happens next. Uh, on the digital slides online, I've got a bunch of links at the end. Uh, so one of the people, a trans woman who is in charge of, and part of the team, rather, of bringing that, those gender options to Facebook, uh, was not allowed to use her name on Facebook, for example. <laughs> but it's real enough to be an employee there. Uh, so I'm not really clear on what the motivations are, what actually happens behind the scenes. We see things like consultancy, and that looks like good work sometimes. But then maybe that just doesn't go anywhere substantially. Yeah. I'm not really aware of anything that's going on behind the scenes. I think like, my area of interest is more just like, how we choose the things that are always going to forever be co opted, and like, how we could think more just about the ways that we as users can like, more responsibly like, use things. Because I think, like, to some degree, even if Facebook tried its best, it's still Facebook. So, like, I don't know. Like, I don't want to diminish the importance of that kind of work and that kind of consultancy. 
consistency. But I think to some degree, like placing the conversation like too much there might kind of like neuter our responsibility. Yeah, I would agree with that take. Um, I've been in the position, um, if not necessarily on like these kind of issues, but like just before of kind of being the um, person who's got to take it on to work from within on something, and it's incredibly demoralizing. Um, because uh, more often than not, it's a, uh, these kind of responses um, or these kind of initiatives, um, they have a function, um, and they're often, I don't want to dismiss it just as a PR move, but like part of their function is to be a PR move. Um, and um, to promote diversity insofar as diversity is profitable. Um, and that's also the way in which like a lot of businesses conceptualize diversity um, as like a profit um, exercise. Um, I don't know, I, I, I think it's um, an important conversation, um, but it's, uh, yeah, I, I think it's an important conversation, but I don't have tons of hope, so I'm, I'm uh, more in agreement with uh, what uh, Kelly was saying in terms of uh, thinking, do what we can to try to change things, but then mostly focus on what's immediately in our communities and systems. Are there any more? Oh, we're at the back. Okay. Okay. Hi. Um, well, it, it seems to me that one of the ways that we keep running aground is um, uh, on the issue of representation itself, and it seems to me that the um, that that it as a trope and um, paired with the sort of development structures and programming structures that underlie much of this technology are still based in a notion of uh, visibility um, and appearance that's, that's grounded in the Enlightenment. So that the idea of a programming binary and the, the, that those things are actually where the money is made and those are the things that aren't necessarily changed by the appearance of inclusivity or the notion of representation. Um, it's at the level at which we expect visibility to somehow provide uh, a, uh, a benign solution that, uh, that we get into trouble. And, and, and similarly, the fact that these structures are so based around sight and appearance um, often means that we ignore um, the flattening and impoverishment that occurs in our daily experience and our relationship to them. Yeah. <laughs> I, um, I mean, one of the things I'm like really interested in is that like I um, I study um, and write about narrative and I and I think I think um, it's, it's very interesting to think about how um, visibility plays a role, but also um, uh, the risk of just looking up way too much um, irrelevant Marxist terminology. It's like there's there's still like a, a superstructure <laughs> um, that's that's there, and, and a lot of things uh, function when they do because they they, they do serve. Um, and uh, visibility and representation only goes so far. Um, representation in like a visual sense um, feels good, uh, but representation in terms of like who's actually able to um, be involved in systems and enact change there is a, a wholly different matter. I think this will be our last question. I think. Like Simon ties a lot of what's been said together is like the distinction between, uh, I guess, denotational meaning, where the thing is, you know, you ascribe the meaning to a thing, uh, and connotational meaning, where the meaning comes from how something is used and how it has been used. I think, but with emoji, part of the problem is that Unicode Consortia doesn't really want to be in the business of working with connotation. They care. They want. They really, all they really, what they really care about is having lots of different ways, lots of different alphabets in one unified system so that you can have any sort of language that has a written form should have some way of encoding that into a computer. So they need, so they have sort of the denotational problem of what number means the letter A? What number means the, the, the Hansa character for cat? So that sort of thing. Whereas, with emoji, they're kind of like, because they're inherently not linguistic, really, they're kind of only ever going to be what sort of, the meaning is only ever going to come from the way we use them. And 
similarly, with the whole uh, pinkwashing gender stuff with like Facebook, that's another case where gender is a very connotational thing, at least, or at least connotational way of looking at it is a very queer way of looking at gender. Mm -hmm. uh, denotationally, male, man, uh, etc., they all mean the same thing, but co the connotations are very different. That's why it's kind of, that's why it looks weird to us that Facebook have chosen male and female, and actually mm -hmm. a lot of people would say man and woman are mm -hmm. much sort of better terms, even though they kind of mean the same thing. Because, and I think the part of the problem is that capitalism requires this denotational view because it requires a taxonomy of people so that they can use that to tailor things, uh, tailor their advertising and stuff like that. I just, I was going to kind of a thought more than a question, but... <laughs> it's really good and I appreciate it. Um, and it's, it touched on a lot of things that I think came up more in this discussion and tied them together really neatly. Um, so thank you. Um, yeah, and, there's, and I think that idea of um, uh, the creation of categories um, and um, different ways of understanding gender in particular um, uh, kind of connects with the representation stuff that I, <laughs> um, that I was uh, bringing up because it's like, what does it mean to transition? What does it mean to be a woman? Um, what does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be trans? Um, or any, um, any alignment within any of those categories? Um, and those things are... Um, Policed, like they're 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 um, both metaphorically and literally. Um, so it's uh, it's interesting to think about that in terms of um, the representations um, and what that kind of does um, and what the uh, the role of it in a the, in a material world coming from different um, sources and two different audiences. Yeah, I think just want to tag on to that. In terms like putting connotational use first. And I think like, just to like, I guess like tie up our discussion, I think like in sort of affecting what those connotations are, I think that's really like the excitement. So I think we should all you know, be really affecting our connotative work. And um, yeah. <laughs> thank you all so much for coming. And please join me in thanking our pretty